Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's uh, program about the Chasco uh, Teeter Curatorial Internship Program. Um, I am Jana Spoon, and I am the Public Programs Coordinator at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. The museum is committed to the crucial mission of educating our diverse community about Jewish life and heritage before, during, and after the Holocaust. As part of our mission, our programs illuminate the stories of survivors, broader histories of hate and anti-Semitism, stories of resilience against injustice, and more. And I just want to thank you for joining us today virtually. Uh, we do hope that you will visit the museum in person to see our core exhibition, The Holocaust, What Heat Can Do, alongside our new exhibition, Courage to Act, which is our first exhibition designed for children and families. Uh, we appreciate the support of our members so much here at the museum. And if you want to get closer to the museum to enjoy exclusive programs, free admission, you can explore the museum membership uh, on our website or email membership at mjh.myc, uh, mjhmyc.org, sorry, uh, to learn more. Um, closed captions are available on today's program. Uh, there are instructions on how to turn captions on or off. They will be posted in the chat, in addition to all of the links that exist in the chat that connect you to our museum website. Um, if you have questions for our speakers during the program, please put them in the Zoom Q&A box, and we will get to as many as we can by the end of the program. Um, today, we are honored to be joined by Judy Tietel Peter Bommel Schwartz and Miriam Enten. Um, and I would love to give you an introduction about them. So, Professor Judy Teeter Bommel Schwartz is the director of the Arnold and Leona Finkler Institute of Holocaust Research, the Abraham and Adida Spiegel Family Professor in Holocaust Research, the Rabbi Pincus Brenner Professor in Research on the Holocaust European Jewry, and Professor of Modern Jewish History in the Israel and Golda uh, Department of Jewish History and Contemporary Jewry at the Bar Ilan University. Ramat Gan, Israel. Uh, she is the consulting historian and curator of the Museum of Jewish Heritage in New York. We are also joined by Miriam Enten, the fourth year PhD student in the archaeology subfield of the anthropology program at the CUNY Graduate Center in New York City. As part of her graduate fellowship, she also teaches at City College, CUNY. Uh, Miriam interned for the collections and exhibitions department at the Museum of Jewish Heritage during the summers 2021 and 2023, the latter for which she was also named the inaugural Chaskal Teeter curatorial intern. Um, and so now I'm going to hand things over to our Vice President of Collections and Exhibitions, Maggie Rad. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Janos, for the introduction. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Um, in addition to greeting our speakers today, each of whom is wise and wonderful academic, but also dear friends, I would also like to send a warm welcome to the incoming Pascal Tudor curatorial intern, Alison Ruman, who I believe is in the audience today. Alison has her master's in European history, politics, and society. She is fluent in German and mm -hmm. is an MJH alum, having done an internship during her undergrad in the museum's education department. She will be an incredible addition to the team and her knowledge and commitment is deserving of a position within this prestigious internship program. As Janos, excuse me, as Janos mentioned, uh, my name is Maggie Rad. I'm the Vice President of Collections and Exhibitions here at the museum. We are an actively collecting institution with approximately 45,000 objects in our collection. These range the full gamut of materiality and theme, photography, documents, textiles, home goods, etc. They are ritual objects, precious things families brought with them as they fled persecution, a lighthouse tender boat used during the Danish rescue, and evidentiary material like the hand annotated map of Buchenwald taken by a liberator and the dresser with a hidden compartment the soldier used to store away these haunting materials for decades. Our museum prides itself on telling this important history through personal lived experiences. When someone contacts us with a donation inquiry, we not only ask what the objects are and how they fit into the overall history, but also the detailed lived experience of the person who owned or used the objects. The museum's curators and Miriam as the Haskell T. Door curatorial intern embark on meticulous research into objects provenance and the related history to ensure objects on offer are suitable for the museum's collection and to ensure we can tell the most robust stories possible. 
when thinking of the inaugural Haskell Tudor internship, which my colleague Judy will tell you more about in a moment, um, and this related program, it was absolutely clear that we needed to share with you the personal connections both of our brilliant scholars have to the museum's new acquisitions program. Their families are both represented within the collection and they have both worked with the museum to usher in new objects into our care. Our commitment to families like Judy's and like Miriam's is that whenever their objects are used to tell this important history, it will always be done foregrounded through their loved ones lived experiences. I look very forward to hearing more from both Judy and Miriam uh, sharing their insights with you further. Um, and on that note, I would like to yield the floor to Judy. Thank you so much, Maggie. Uh, this is a, a thrilling experience for me. It's actually the culmination of something that we've been working on. When I say we, it's not just me, it's Maggie and Sarah and the, the entire team that some of you are in the audience, Trevor, et cetera, um, that, that it's, we've been working on this for ages. How did it start? Who am I? It's not important, but who has a little tea is my father. That's a lot more important. And that's what I'm going to be speaking about and our connection to the Museum of Jewish Heritage. First, a couple of words about my father. If we just move along with the slides, you can actually see a picture of him. We have finished the introduction. Onward. Here we are. Okay, this is a picture of my father, Haskell Tidor. As you can see, he has a number on his arm. He was an Auschwitz survivor. And there he is with one of his great granddaughters, Stephanie, in 1988. Um, my father was born in Poland, in Bochnia, in 1903, and like tens of thousands of Jews, his family, at the beginning of World War I, um, escaped, basically ran away from the incoming Russian forces and moved westward. He ended up in Germany, where his family remained after the war, and he grew up there. He married. He had two children. I have a brother and sister from my father's first marriage, and in 1939, he was deported as a um, as a Polish Jew. He was taken into German military custody, Nazi military custody, moved into Buchenwald, spent two years there, ended up going to Auschwitz, where he spent another three years. And at the end of the war, on the death march, he marched back to Buchenwald. In other words, from the first week of the war to the last week of the war, he was in Nazi concentration and extermination camps. And as he says, by the grace of God, he survived. He... After the war, actually, that, that did not end all of his, his travails. But during the war, he saved hundreds, maybe even thousands of people in Nazi camps because of his position as a work supervisor and um, a work dispatcher. After the war, he continued his activities, and he was one of the founders of the first post-war kibbutz, Kibbutz Buchenwald, and he took the first group of liberated Jews, men and women, youngsters, some as young as 12, 14 years old. He brought them to pre-state Israel. Um, then he discovered that his two children, his wife, his parents, his sister, had all been murdered during the Holocaust by the Nazis, but that his two children had survived. And during the war, they had been taken to the United States. He came from pre-state Israel to America, and he went back and forth for a couple of years trying to convince them to come. They were already Americanized. They, they, as my sister had said, she had been through five countries. It was enough. And he understood that. And he came to America. And he lived in America for 23 years, during which time he met my mother. I was born. After that, when I was 15, we moved back to Israel, my father, my mother, and I. And this is where I'm speaking to you from today. When I started my connection with the Museum of Jewish Heritage, which started several years ago, I learned that we already had a connection to the museum long before mine. And if we move on to the next slide, here we are. This is my great grandmother, but on the other side, this is my mother's grandmother, Dvora Enzenberg. This is a picture of her sometime during the 1930s, standing in front of her home in a small town called Mihova, which was in Romania. And you can see that she's standing on a rug in front of the house. This was a picture taken before the Holocaust, and the picture became important only because of, let's move on to the next slide, we have, that is the same rug that she stood on. Why is that rug important, and why is it part of the collection? Well, here's the story of the rug. In 1941, 
when the Jews of that area of Romania, of what was known as Bukovina, were being deported by the Romanians to an area that had been given to them by the Nazis after the Dniester River called Transnistria. All the Jews of the area were tens of thousands of Jews were deported to there. Nachman, my grandfather, married to Deborah, was outside the house. He was a farmer and the police wouldn't let him go into the house to get a coat. It was September, it was cold. So he grabbed the floor rug from the front of the house. He wrapped it around his shoulders. And that basically, as you can see, it says kitchen rug, but it's it's a floor rug. And it was worn by him as a shawl, as a coat in Transnistria where he froze to death in 1942. He and Zvora, his wife, died one day after another. Their daughter, Jenny, was with them, my great aunt. And she saved the rug, and sometime in the early 1990s, she donated it to the Museum of Jewish Heritage because she said this would be a good place for them to keep it, and maybe one day they would show it. When I started working together with the museum, one of the things that I did is I was a curator in the for the new core exhibition, The Holocaust, What Hate Can Do. And we decided that we were going to use not only this rug, as you can see, this is in one of the upstairs rooms, go if you have not yet seen the exhibition, go and see it. And then you can also see the rug. But to show originally how it was used, we have on the entrance in the long corridor in the entrance to the exhibition, the picture of Dvora Enzenberg standing on the rug. So you can see that my family was already part of the museum before I became part of the museum. And actually, it goes on from all sides. If we go on to the next slide, please. Here we go. This is from a totally different side of the family. This is from my husband's side of the family. This was a wall textile. As you can see, it's embroidered and with Hebrew lettering. I'll explain it in a minute. It was made in 1896 by his great, great grandmother, Vichna Yablonsky Krieger. She did what a lot of Jewish women did at the time. She embroidered a wall textile with the names and the dates of death of all of her family. This is what was called a yurtzeit day. Yurtzeit literally is the, the date of death. It, it's the year, time of the year that the person died with the information about her mother, her father, her husband's mother and her husband's father. And here we have the whole family. This was actually donated by my husband's first cousin, by the, the Zimmerman family. And um, it is now part of the museum's collection. So as you can see, we are connected on all sides. Now, how does, what does all of this wonderful textiles that we're seeing have to do with the Haskell Tidor curatorial internship? One of the things that we very much wanted to do was to memorialize, to do something worthwhile for my father, for Haskell Tidor. And together with Maggie, here I have to give her all the credit, the idea came up. We wanted to do something that had to do with curatorial. And we decided together on inaugurating the curatorial internship named after my father. And we had the honor and the privilege of Miriam being the first curatorial intern. And the idea is that my father always loved teaching young people various things. He, he did that throughout his life. And the idea is that through this internship, young people, young professionals have the opportunity to be on site and to work and to learn new things, particularly from Maggie and her entire team about what it means to be a curator and what it means to curate all these objects. Behind every single one of these objects, there's a person, there's a human being, there's a story. There's Vichna Yablonsky Krieger. I have pictures of her when she was a very, very not young woman. But once upon a time, she was a little girl. And before that, all those people who were on that textile were all very old and we have their dates of death. They were all young people. And the museum tells the story of all of these people. It's Jewish heritage. And so now we're going to hear a little bit more about internship and objects and connections to people from Miriam and I hand the floor to you. Hey, thank you so much, Judy, Maggie, and Janos, and good, af good afternoon, everyone. It is the afternoon already. My name is Miriam Enton. I'm currently a fourth year PhD student in the archaeology subfield of the anthropology department at the CUNY Graduate Center. 
I also teach an undergraduate archaeology course at City College. In terms of my research, I am broadly interested in the historical archaeology of Jewish presence. And for my dissertation, I will specifically be illuminating the use and significance of ritual baths or mikvaot in the Jewish tradition and how these features can inform our understanding of the early modern Sephardic Jewish diaspora in the Caribbean. Although I am a doctoral student and therefore in academia, post-graduation, I am interested in pursuing a career in museum work. And the way that I've been able to gain hands-on museum and collections experience in recent years has been through summer internships, taking advantage of the few months when I'm not in the classroom. <laughs> I have been fortunate to intern twice at the North American Archaeology Lab at the American Museum of Natural History, as well as at the New York City Archaeological Repository under the auspices of the Landmarks Preservation Commission. But most importantly, both in terms of relevance to this program and in terms of how meaningful the experience was to me, I've also interned twice for the Museum of Jewish Heritage in 2021 as a collections and exhibitions intern, and most recently in 2023 as the inaugural Haskell Tidor curatorial intern. Stepping into that role was an honor. I had learned about Haskell Tidor, Aleph Shalom, who, as you've all heard, was a Holocaust survivor from Auschwitz and was um, pretty famously entrusted uh, with and saved a shofar that had been blown there on Rosh Hashanah. And so being the collections and exhibitions intern was one thing, but having the name Haskell Tidor included in my title provided an extra layer of meaning and purpose to my internship and I am grateful to have been awarded that opportunity and responsibility. To dive into my day-to-day -day agenda as an intern, I was able to gain experience in data management, donor filing, Holocaust testimony digitization, blog post writing, and exhibition prep, among other tasks. I was fortunate in both rounds of my internship to be at the museum when the openings for brand new exhibitions were on the horizon. In 2021, the opening of Boris Lurie, Nothing to Do But to Try, was imminent, and the museum's current core exhibition, The Holocaust, What Hate Can Do, was in the planning stages. And just this summer, the opening of Courage to Act, Rescue in Denmark, was only a couple of months away. It was a lot of fun and quite rewarding to have had a hand in these exhibitions, however small, whether proofreading exhibition labels and scripts, or reviewing and streamlining other people's notes so that drafts could move through the various channels. I'd like to thank everyone in collections and exhibitions for allowing me to play a part. I'd also like to share in more detail a task I completed in my internship role. I was given the chance to produce a new acquisition nomination or NAM form. When someone is thinking of donating an object to the museum, the Collections and Exhibitions Department is tasked with conducting research on said object, as well as on the donor's family history, and organizing this information to be presented at a new acquisitions committee meeting. And there, it is decided whether the object in question will be acquired by the museum or not. So if we could go to the next slide. So I chose to research a document that someone wanted to donate to the museum. She wasn't sure what the document was and wasn't immediately aware of any family history related to the object. Um, it was in Hebrew and she thought it might have been a family tree. The document had been rolled up in a drawer for years and when unrolled, it reached a whopping 10 feet. This is only a small section of it. So I had an initial hunch about what the document was, but upon investigating, I confirmed that it is a Kabbalistic tree. As some may know, Kabbalistic trees have been produced for hundreds of years as diagrammatic representations of God and, and the divine realms. And this tree is attributed to Rabbi Meir Poppers. It was produced in 1864 in Warsaw, Poland, and represents the first time that a Kabbalistic tree was printed instead of handwritten and therefore made more accessible for the masses. The scroll is made of individual sheets of paper that were printed on and then glued end to end. I was able to compile a lot of information about this Kabbalistic tree and about Kabbalistic trees in general, 
which in turn led the object donor to delve into her own family history and discover that the tree must have belonged to her mother's father, a devoted Kabbalist, and their family. So I presented my research to the new acquisitions committee. The Kabbalist tree was nominated for acquisition, and in September, it formally became part of the museum's collection. I think it is wonderful and commendable that the collections and exhibitions department offers an internship that includes true work experience. I was never made to feel like I was just an intern. The work I was doing was valuable and consequential and honestly on par with everybody else's responsibilities. And I really appreciated that. In addition to all this, um, I was perhaps most notably afforded the ability to meet a couple of times with Judy, um, who uh, you know we've just had the pleasure of hearing from and uh, to check in about my internship progress as well as my broader academic and professional journey. I'm grateful for her guidance and I hope that we continue to keep in touch well beyond this program. So I finally like to share a bit more of a personal experience that occurred while I was an intern at the museum. I am the granddaughter of three Holocaust survivors. My grandfather, Emanuel Fried, Aleph HaShalom, who survived Theresienstadt, my grandfather, Mark Blisko, Aleph HaShalom, who survived Auschwitz, and my grandmother, Brenda, Brenda Blisko, who was sent from Poland as an orphan to live out the war in Soviet Russia. One morning during my first uh, internship in 2021, I was searching through the museum's collection database as part of a task that I had been given and on a hunch, I decided to search my grandfather's name, Emanuel Fried. And if we can go to the next slide, immediately um, a result came up showing his name, his current address, and an object that he had apparently donated to the museum in 1989. As you can imagine, I was very excited about this development and was given permission to explore further. I learned that the object was a Theresen ghetto scrip, a 20 kronen note that he had earned for his work in the camp. Of course, this system of payment for work was just a ploy to make the Red Cross think that Theresienstadt was a humane camp. And my grandfather's job at the age of 14 was to collect the bodies of those who had died in the night and to lay them out for disposal. It was rewarding enough to be able to research this object and metaphorically bring it out of storage. I also wrote a blog post about the discovery, which is posted on the museum's website. But then as the opening date neared for the Holocaust What Hate Can Do, I received an email letting me know that the script would be featured in the exhibition. And once the exhibition opened, my grandfather was shown pictures of his object on display. And although he never had a chance to see the show in person, he was very proud of his contribution. If we could go to the next slide. My grandfather passed away this past June. He's a Baruch, may his memory be a blessing. To conclude, I am truly honored to have been the inaugural Haskell Tidor curatorial intern and to have worked alongside some incredible people. You know who you are. Um, I look forward to seeing who the next Classical Tidor curatorial interns will be. We know who the next one will be. <laughs> um, and I trust that this internship program will endure at the museum for years to come. In the merit of the important work done in Classical Tidor's name, may his neshama have an aliyah and may his legacy live on. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing with us. Um, I would love to be able to open uh, the floor to a Q&A. Um, anybody who hasn't dropped any questions for our lovely speakers, please feel free to do so in our Q&A Zoom. Um, this is a, our first question is for Miriam. Um, somebody would like to know what your favorite and most memorable part of the internship was. Oh, goodness. There were so many. Um, <laughs> thank you for that question. I think that one thing I look back on, which is sort of more of a general memory, is just really going through the collections and, and searching the database and being able to work on different projects associated with different objects. Because, you know, I think growing up, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm from an Ashkenazi Eastern European background and you know, we rarely get to see and hear about different aspects of Jewish culture, whether it's more 
you know, Sephardic, um, Greek, Jewish communities, very, you know, different traditions everywhere and different sorts of objects that you might find coming from these different communities. And it's just really, really great to be able to search um, through the collections and to see the, the diversity of objects that the museum has. And, you know, especially in, in these, you know, trying times today, it's really inspiring to see how different you know, Jewish people, um, you know, held held fast and held true to their Jewish identities um, at different uh, points in history, especially during the Holocaust, of course. So that's something that that definitely stands out for me. Thank you so much. Um, another question, this is for both Miriam and Judy. Um, do you have any advice for current students who would like to get involved in curation or object collections? And Maggie, feel free to jump in as well. Oh, well, Judy, I'm muted first, so please, after you. No, 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 that's Maggie. <laughs> you want to get uh, everything that you can. <laughs> probably from the right people, and the right people are here at the Museum of Jewish Heritage. <laughs> that's absolutely true. Um, I think um, there are a lot of different ways to um, to come to this uh, profession and this, um, and this experience. Um, I think um, both from an educational path and from an experience path. Uh, my personal path um, came largely through experience having um, started volunteering at a museum at 15 years old. Certainly not everyone has the luxury of, of, um, of volunteerism. Um, but um, I think aside from that, uh, the best advice I can give um, is in kind of dedication to my professional mentor, who I don't believe I remember to send this link to, and so she's not with us today. Um, but I was blessed to have aligned myself with someone who was willing to teach me anything I was willing to learn. Um, and so, um, you know, finding the right opportunity, finding um, whether it's, um, as we say, whether it's through education, finding the right, the right school, the right scholars, or the right, um, just mentors and um, and the right institution to align yourself with, uh, and being um, really just a sponge for um, for knowledge, uh, whether it's you know, specific historical knowledge or um, or workflow and kind of um, museum uh, best practice. Um, exposing yourself to that, absorbing as much of it as you can. Um, and, uh, and we talk a lot about the museum bug biting you early, letting that bug bite you um, <laughs> will will take you very far in your in your experience. And um, I agree with with all of that. And I guess uh, one thing that I would suggest is, you know, I think when people think of museums, you think of very large scale institutions, but there is something to be said for just knocking on the door of your local historical society and asking if they need help, um, kind of getting that small scale experience that can then build into something bigger. Absolutely that. Uh, the museum I started at um, as a 15 year old volunteer um, was, was very, very small and, um, Again, we were allowed to wear as many hats as we were willing to um, to be instructed on how to properly wear. So uh, the small institutions, and um, I say that uh, from an institution that may, many people don't think of as small. Um, we, uh, you know, have a, a sizable staff, a sizable gallery space, a, quite a robust collection. But in many ways, the MJH um, has a um, kind of small museum feel in the way that we collaborate. Um, and so finding that, you know, whether Finding that that small museum feel um, or historical society or or et cetera um, really is invaluable. I think. I would add to that hanging around. The stories that you told Maggie are, are very similar to how I became a historian. I hung around the library of the Institute of Holocaust Research, and I was there all the time and talking to the people working there all the time. And anytime I could help with something, I could help out and. All of a sudden, they needed somebody to do a project for three months. I said, oh, wow, Judy's always around, so I'll let her. And, well, that's how I became a professor of Jewish history. <laughs> Thank you so much for those answers. Those are really great. Um, uh, another question that we have is, um, how long logistically is the internship? When does the next one begin? And is there only one intern at a time? There is um, the Haskell to Door curatorial internship um, occurs twice a year. 
Um, it does, um, there's one person that fills the, the position at a time. Uh, the next one is actually starting this month. Um, and I believe that all internships are approximately uh, three days a week for three months. Great, thank you. Um, uh, we have another question we just got added, um, is how is the Kabbalah tree displayed or how is it used back in Warsaw pre-war? Okay, so I guess you can sort of answer that, that um, so in, in terms of at the museum, the, the scroll is not on display currently. Um, it is part of the collection. Um, in terms of how it would have been used, so it, it was rolled up, or we said it was 10 feet long. It's not very practical to have it completely unrolled all the time. So you would have, you know, somebody who was a Kabbalist, they would be studying it. It would usually be kind of gradually unrolled and they would be able to study and almost meditate over the different diagrams. It was a very meditative experience kind of scrolling through. And you can imagine even before the days of electricity, you would have had kind of flickering candles in the room and you're sort of meditating over these divine-esque diagrams. Um, so it's it must have been a very um, a very spiritual uh, experience for for people who used it, and and it is very interesting that sort of that fed into each other. That there was the scroll that kind of led to the act of scrolling and this this meditation, and it kind of made sense. Um, it's very interesting to to learn about. Um, the, the evolution of these scrolls. And there are a couple of fantastic uh, books out there um, about them. One recently written called The Kabbalistic Tree. I believe it's Princeton uh, University Press kind of talks about uh, the history of these scrolls and their use through time. Highly recommended. Uh, Miriam, I have another question for you. Um, so you've spoken about your connection to the exhibition. But we were wondering if there were any other uh, objects in the collection from your family and if you would be able to speak further about those. Um, yes, so there is one other um, object that I discovered, which was a testimony from my other grandfather, Mark Blisco. Um, so, so I finished doing everything with um, with my father's father, Emmanuel Fried, and then after all that was done, I was like, oh, here we go. And I typed in my other grandfather's name and it also came up. Uh, and so he had done an interview in 1979 uh, through the uh, Yaffa Eliach Center for Holocaust Studies um, collection um, because there was this person, Dina Cohn, who was in Yaffa Eliach's class at Brooklyn College, and she interviewed my grandfather. And all of those interviews that were done by Yaffa Eliach went into her collection. And um, at some point, I'm not sure exactly when, but uh, the, the CHS, the Center for Holocaust Studies collection became part of the Museum of Jewish Heritage so that now the museum has all of those testimonies. And so I was able to listen to this interview um, that my family had not heard in, in a very long time, I, as, as I understand. Um, again, nobody really knew what happened to it after it went to Yaffa Eliach and I was able to listen to it. And then I was in a, a graduate class uh, a history graduate class and for the the final project for that class I was I convinced my professor to let me fully transcribe that testimony um, which took many hours it was it was only a 45 minute interview but the audio quality was it left a lot to be desired and so I was able to fully transcribe it and also add some historical context if some things needed to be clarified so that was a very fulfilling project as well and so I'm glad to have uh, been involved with um, kind of both sides of my family in the collection that was really a um, wonderful opportunity. Thank you so much thank you. Um, I, there's an additional question that I think everybody could answer, I mean, especially with their work that they've done in the exhibition, um, but is there typically within our institution and outside of our institution a standard to which we evaluate new donations? Um, and then is a whole collection donated or is it item by item? I'll take that one off. Um, the most museums um, do certainly rely on um, on donations to grow their collection. Uh, the MJH is um, is among them. Um, 
there, um, there's certainly some objects in the collection that were uh, purchased with uh, funds donated uh, for that express purpose. Um, but largely, as we say, um, we rely on donation. Um, with regard to research, um, certainly every museum has a collecting um, policy um, that identifies exactly the kinds of materials that um, can be entered into the collection, what themes, what materiality, if there are any restrictions, et cetera. Um, and so when, uh, particularly given um, how our museum tells stories, we do a little bit of additional work that not all other museums do. And so certainly, um, you know, for example, when Judy or Miriam's families you know, came to my predecessors and Judy has made recent donations. So when uh, Judy came to me um, there and my my uh, dear colleagues in collections and exhibitions, um, you know, we ask all the same questions that every other institution asks um, you know, with regard to provenance research, who owned it, what is it, what was it used for, how old is it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we take it a step further because of the mechanism in which we tell stories being um, you know, directly related to, uh, to the family. And so uh, with regard, um, to the shofar that Miriam mentioned earlier, um, we uh, that that object is not in our collection, but it, it's one that I use as our example very often because it's got such an incredible story and it dovetails, I think, with um, one with day, our one commitment. Day the collection. <laughs> Sorry. One day it will be part of the collection. Bless you. <laughs> I very much look forward to that. Um, but so. Um, Perfect example then, when Judy comes to us ready to make this donation, um, you know, we will gather all this information, we'll do research um, into the, um, the the family's history, um, really to um, to confirm, you know, information that's being received, um, you know, over the years, certainly sometimes details get a little bit fuzzy, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we then, as we say, confirm that it is uh, something that would be suitable for our collecting policy. Um, we look at it from a, um, from a condition perspective to ensure that there is nothing about the object that you know, maybe would require a significant amount of conservation or would um, necessarily be a, um, a hazard to the objects that are already in our collection. Um, but as I say, as we, we take it a step further to receive all of the, um, the individual information and that um, that is specific to our commitment to the families that, um, and as I say, this is the example I use all the time, that shofar will never just be a shofar. It will always be a shofar that was blown on Rosh Hashanah in a camp. It will always be the shofar that was carried on the death march by Haskell Tudor. Um, and that I think is what really makes our institution um, kind of sets us apart from all of our peers, um, that it, the stories are always told in that way and that um, we hope really resonates more with our visitorship. Thank you. Um, I do, I have a question about uh, an object for Judy. Um, so the, the Zimmerman textile was recently treated by the textile lab at St. John the Divine. And I understand that that treatment led to new information. Um, would you be able to explain what was learned about the family and the maker? Oh, yes, of course. About the maker, uh, we could only figure out when we could understand exactly what was written there. Because for years, we thought that it was my husband's great-grandmother. And we were sure because of the year she came to the United States a few years before. So we figured that she was writing about her, her ancestors, but her parents were alive at the time. So it certainly wasn't her parents. And she wasn't married because she only got engaged in 1899. And so we thought maybe she was writing about her grandparents. However, once the, the restorers did their marvelous job and I got close up pictures of it, we tried to read the Hebrew text. There are a lot of abbreviations there that are not your usual abbreviations and had to figure them out. But once we did, then we saw that it was not my grandparents' date, but this was my my beloved father, my beloved mother. And we realized that it was, we thought it was Lena Krieger Scheidler's. It wasn't, it was Lena's mother. That's Virlia Yablonski Krieger. And it also didn't make sense in terms of the names because unlike my father's side of the family where everybody perished in Europe and we have names, but we don't have tombstones. That's not the, the written form 
that we have, there's a limit to how far we could go back. On my husband's side, the relatives came to the United States from the late 1800s on. And I myself have visited many cemeteries and seen their tombstones. The names of their parents are written there also. And all of a sudden we could figure out, hey, it didn't make sense. This was written the same year, but it was written by a generation back. So only once we could interpret exactly what the names were, which took a little while, now, well, we can go back, what now, seven generations and know the names seven generations back in the family. For a lot of people, that's nothing. Okay, like, you know, who cares? But when you come from a Holocaust background, like I do, second generation, there's this brick wall that there was nobody that you could ask. So I could ask my father, what were the names of his parents? Of course, I'm named after his mother and his, his sister and who his, my brother is named after his grandfather but past there what was the name there's nobody to go there all the records are destroyed etc so all of a sudden to have records and to be able to go back and say seven generations those are real people at least for me it meant a lot those stories are so incredibly important and, and in Relisha, and I think a great bouncing off question would be, um, you, you've you made another donation recently uh, related to Devorah Eisenberg, and, and could you speak to that object? And maybe, Miriam, you could speak about your, your research regarding that object as well. Yes, yes. Actually, there, there's more than one donation when I think about it. I'm getting back to the Oblonskis and the Kriegers. We have the trunk, the famous trunk that Exactly. When Vitna and her husband came to the United States, they already had a representative. Their daughter had come a few years before. And it seems that she had come via Manchester, where at some point she picked up this big steamer trunk in which she packed all of her worldly goods and came with it to the United States. And that went to her daughter. And that went to her granddaughter, who was my mother-in-law. And for years, my mother-in-law had this gigantic trunk and she used to say this belonged to Abelina when she came to the United States and I heard so many stories about her and she said to me who's going to want this trunk and then when I started being associated with the museum she said to me you know the museum would really this this I would love if this would go to the museum and eventually it did and so that's another object that we have from the family but more recently I donated Laura Enzenberg's marriage wig which was also saved by her daughter, Jenny. And that was passed down in the family. It went from Jenny to my mother, who was the daughter of the oldest daughter of the oldest daughter of the oldest daughter in the family. And then after my mother passed away 10 years ago, it came to me. And at some point I said, where can this go that it will mean something? Because I, I spoke to my daughters and it, it didn't really mean anything to them. They're not historians. So I said, okay, we already have a family collection. We have pictures of Flora and of Nachman. We have the rug, which is there. That's the best place. And I was thrilled when Maggie said, yes, of course, we would like to add it to the collection. And very recently, the, the, the wig was given to the museum. And I assume that it will go through whatever process that it goes through. But this is a a marriage wig that was created. Well, when did my great grandmother get married? 1895. January 1895. In fact, it, when I think about it, it I, I even have the dates because she she the, the family story is that her father passed away very, very young, suddenly, obviously of a heart attack. They sat Shiva, the wedding had been set, and on the last day of Shiva, the seven days of mourning, she got up and she prepared for a wedding because by Jewish custom you do not postpone a wedding. And she went straight from Shiva from her father, and that date we have to her own wedding. And let me just take a look in the diary. I'll tell you to the date exactly how many years since 1895. Think about it. Wow. Okay. So I have everybody's yurt sites and, and birthdays and everything in my personal diary, which I'm holding here. And I can tell you that at the end of the month is Vichna Krieger's yurt site, the one from the that textile. And that marriage wig next week. Next week is going to be the first time that it was worn at my great grandmother's wedding. So there you have it. 1895. Let's count the years. Where are we? 2024. That's like 129 years ago this week. 
Incredible. Judy, do I remember correctly that um, she was wearing the wig in the photo you share, shared earlier in your presentation? Yes, there it is. Actually, if you bring up the photo, you can see the wig. It has gone through a lot since then, but that's what it looked like in sometime in the early 1930s. Indeed, but thinking in terms of um, collecting holistically, obviously, you know, when, when a family is interested in sharing materials, we love it when they come with a full story told through objects. And uh, so we have, um, you know, that, that photo in our collection, we've got the wig she was wearing and the rug she was standing on, um, all thanks to the, the generosity of, um, of Judy and her family. It was our pleasure and our privilege. That's, that's truly so amazing. Absolutely. Um, I'm learning so much myself. So thank you so much. Um, I, I do have another question. And this is referencing um, how we select our interns and what what qualities we look for whenever we are um, bringing somebody into this program. Um, absolutely. Good question. Uh, so I did put in the, uh, the chat the link for um, for the internship um, in blurb and um, an application process, if anyone was interested in um, in future um, rounds, um, I think um, you know it is a curatorial internship, um, and so uh, people come to curatorial through a lot of different angles, um, and that is reflected um, certainly in the um, the applicants that we have received and that we um, and that we review. It is open to collegiate students, um, and so um, you know Miriam is a PhD candidate. Um, Allison, who will be her uh, successor, is um, is uh, just received her master's, um, and so um, we, we would we would absolutely uh, consider undergrad applicants as well, um, and they can come from you know from a wide variety of um, of fields of study, whether it's Holocaust studies, uh, Jewish history and studies, European studies, museum studies, um, archaeology, anthropology. Um, really, um, because the Museum of Jewish Heritage is not is a is a Holocaust museum, but it's also a Jewish heritage museum, um, and curatorial looks like a lot of different things. It's uh, new acquisitions, it's exhibition creation, it's research. Um, there are um, there are a lot of different angles that you can um, approach the internship from. So um, we look forward to uh, perhaps each of the Haskell Tudor interns um, coming from a different walk of life and and it's very experiencing the internship. Um, differently. Thank you. Um, and Miriam, if you uh, wouldn't mind answering a question about your experience in the internship, um, you mentioned that you worked on at the time during your internship, the upcoming exhibitions. And uh, we were wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about like what that work looked like, maybe like project by project or day by day. Yes. So, um, I, I will say that, you know, that was very different <laughs> day to day and also depending on what the exhibition was. Um, my my first summer I was working on Boris Lurie and um, the Holocaust What Hate Can Do. Um, and, you know, so one was a fairly small exhibition and one was much bigger. So it was, I guess, I guess the overall feeling though was that you know everybody was really working toward an, a very important deadline that was coming up and so it was just a lot of tasks kind of whatever um had to be done at the time whether it was making like a powerpoint to be approved by a committee um you know for which objects would be in in the exhibit or um you know looking at the text that maybe would accompany those objects and doing some proofreading work. Uh, and and there was interestingly something I guess people don't think about is that when, when you have a new exhibition coming in, there's usually maybe one that was going out uh, fairly recently. And so maybe you're working on scanning uh, different reports and things from the previous exhibit to make sure that that one gets sort of closed out properly. There's just a lot going on. Um, one interesting task that was for the most recent exhibit, um, Courage to Act, was that um, I was I was asked if um, I could look in the museum gift shop and do additional uh, kind of research online to see which books were kind of associated with Denmark and, and saving uh, the Jews of Denmark that would be best for selling in the gift shop for this exhibition. So kind of 
you know, coming up with with a, with a list of candidates for books that would accompany the exhibit to be recommended for anybody who came to see it. So just a lot of different tasks, a lot of interesting tasks. And, and again, like I said um, before, it was just really nice that I didn't feel like I was just, you know, bringing coffee, <laughs> that it was really, you know, the intern is really an extra pair of hands kind of doing what everybody else is doing. And it's like, Oh, good. Miriam's here. You can do this today. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I just felt like a really valuable part of the team. I love that. Thank you so much for saying that. Um, I think we we do take very seriously um, that nobody's bringing me my coffee unless I'm really desperate and I'm in a meeting and I still ask a colleague and not an intern because you're you're with us to to learn things. And so um, I would. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't call out. We also have um, in the audience today, our um, CUNY Cultural Corps intern, uh, Messina. And so um, thank you for joining us, Messina. And hopefully someday you'll you'll uh, ex express your experience uh, similarly to Miriam's. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for the time and the care and your presentations and your answers. I hope that this was just as valuable uh, to everybody as it was to us as well. Um, and I really appreciate your, your time. So thank you, Miriam, Judy, Maggie, and everybody else for being here today. Um, and I wanted to close out by saying if you enjoyed today's program, I hope that you uh, connect with our team here at the museum, uh, consider making a donation, um, and that you will join us for our upcoming programs. Um, you can find our upcoming programs at mjhnyc.org backslash current dash events. And next up, uh, we have a conversation with Randall Schoenberg on this Sunday, as well as a community reading of Ellie Wiesel's seminal memoir, Night, which is on Sunday, January 28th.